We continue in our regular sermon series through the book of Ephesians, and this morning we come to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Please listen now as I read, for this is the very word of God. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we pray that by the power of your Spirit, working through your Word, we might be wise in our understanding of the world and that we might truly learn and know Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you don't need me to tell you that our world is a very challenging and difficult place. It seems to be becoming more difficult and challenging by the day. You try to live in this world as a Christian, I think particularly you try to raise children or nurture grandchildren in this world, and often the challenges and difficulties can seem overwhelming. I mean, our world is a world of rampant sexual immorality where almost every standard of biblical sexuality and even foundational notions of gender are under attack. And with the almost omnipresent place of technology, there is a a barrage of sexual images and sexual messaging that is relentless. And we ask, who can stand in such a world? And our world is a world of selfish greed. Increasingly, it seems, people's only standard for behavior is that they want what they want, and they want it now. And again, there's this relentless barrage of of marketing that comes at us. It fuels our desires for acquisition and consumption. Enough is never enough. In such a world, who can stand? And our world is a world of hostility and hate. The fires of discontent are perpetually stoked. The spirit of us versus them seems to reign supreme. No one is really interested in listening to one another or pursuing peace or or endeavoring to agree to disagree with mutual respect and honor. No. Lines are drawn, enemies are made, and the goal is to diminish, disparage, and defeat your foes at all costs. In such a world... Who can stand? And perhaps most troubling, our world is a world of lies. We have fully embraced Pilate's great question to Jesus. Truth? What is truth? (laughs) We scoff at the notion of objective truth that would somehow bind us or obligate us to particular ideas or values or behaviors. Now everything is just a matter of opinion. And information is just a tool to try to get what I want. Twist, spin, distortion, propaganda. It's all agendas now, right? There's no real pursuit of the truth, just the manipulation of words and images to try to gain power and control. In such a world, who can stand? No, that's the real world. That's the world swirling all around us. That's the world that's corrupting us and our children. 
And yet here we are this morning in the midst of such a world. We've gathered to worship in, in beautiful space. We sing beautiful music. We sit under the preaching of God's word. We learn Christian teaching. We're getting grounded in Christian doctrine, studying the book of Ephesians. But there are many who would ask, what are you guys doing? Why are you wasting your time on all of that? What is the relevance of all of that in such a world? Oh, you talk about the Trinity and the the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit's work in redemption. You talk about atonement and election and salvation by grace alone. You talk about gifts in the church and the unity of the Spirit. But what do such things matter in a world like ours? You Christians, you're just fiddling while the nation burns. You're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, right? Who cares about theology and doctrine in times like this? There's a battle out there. It's a mess. It's a moral and ethical war zone. And you guys live in your own little reformed Christian bubble and you play theological parlor games. Well, what shall we say to such things? Does Christian theology and doctrine, verse by verse expositional preaching, does it have any genuine relevance in such a challenging and difficult culture? Does it have any practical value in the real world? Well, I I think we do have to admit that often in our Reformed Presbyterian circles, we can be guilty of talking a lot of theology. Oh, a lot of doctrine, right? But we often do it in a way that is, in fact, disconnected from the challenges and pains of the real world. I know that over the years, I've been in many conversations with guys in particular, guys who love to discuss various aspects of Reformed theology, love to debate about predestination and free will, love to talk about the regulative principle in worship and what churches get it and what churches don't, talk about whether we should be ah-mill or post-mill or pre-mill in our end times views, guys who insisted that their kids memorize the shorter catechism only to discover much later that one of the guys was abusing his wife. Another addicted to pornography. No, often in our circles, we can be guilty of talking, talking, talking about theology and doctrine, but we do it in a way that often has little to no impact on our lives, and we have no impact on the culture. We have to confess, often our theological conversations can exist in kind of an an imaginary parallel universe disconnected from the real world. However, we also need to realize that if we at times can be guilty of this, we we need to see that the Apostle Paul, I, I don't think he was ever guilty of that. No, the Apostle Paul, he was passionate about learning and teaching Christian doctrine. He was passionate that there would be sound doctrine in the church. But for Paul, this was never a theological parlor game. It was never a kind of fun intellectual escape from the messiness of the real world. No, you see, Paul taught, he proclaimed Christian theology because he thought it was the only sufficient response to the real world. He taught Christian theology as the only thing that would ultimately enable us to live and stand as believers in the hard and horrible realities of the real world. And as we get deeper into the book of Ephesians, it becomes increasingly clear that that is driving Paul. Oh yes, here in Ephesians, Paul's teaching us a lot of theology. He's teaching us a lot of doctrine. I would argue Ephesians is one of the greatest doctrinal works ever written. From the very opening verses, Paul has been teaching us the doctrines of salvation and the doctrines of the church. But he has been doing it all along, fully cognizant of the challenges posed by the real world, and he is teaching this in order to challenge the world with such doctrine. 
So as we look at our verses this morning, we see that one of the things Paul does here, as, as in as in-depth a way as he has in this whole letter, he gives us a kind of exposition of the real world. Because you see, Paul does not want us to live in kind of naive church land. He doesn't want us to bury our heads in the sand and hope for the best and say, hey, while we're down here, let's talk some theology. No, he wants us to fully understand the spiritual nature of the world we live in, and then he wants us to be able to know how we must respond to that world. So again, Paul, Paul begins these verses with a kind of exposition of the real world. He, and he, he begins by really talking about the world out there, He lays before us. Here's the way things are out in the pagan world, and he gives that world a label here in the text. It's the way the Gentiles walk. This is the way things are out there, Paul says. Now, we'll see in subsequent verses and subsequent weeks, Paul's going to get into really specific behaviors that are present out there in the world. And we're going to focus on those specific behaviors in the weeks to come. But here, Paul wants us to actually see the root of, of those worldly behaviors. He wants us to see the spiritual source that fuels the activity of the world. And so Paul here, he he digs down deep into the real world. He goes below the surface. And first, he identifies a problem of the mind. He says that Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds, which are darkened in their understanding, And they're alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance. To summarize, Paul says, in the world out there, people don't know God. They don't know who he is. They don't know what he's done. They they don't know about his character or his laws. They don't know what pleases him. They don't know what angers him. They don't know what he requires. Oh, they, they think they know a lot. They may think they know what they want, but but Paul says ultimately their thinking is futile. They're groping around in the darkness. They're alienated from God because they are utterly ignorant of him. Well, you might say, okay, okay, if if the world is ignorant of God, if if they're simply darkened in their understanding of him, and that's why their thinking is futile, then, then we just need to tell them about God, right? We just need to bring him his word, and then everything will be fine, right? I mean, this is nothing that a little information can't fix, right? Paul says, well, the problem is actually a little deeper than that. Because he says here in these verses that the futility of mind in the Gentiles, and by that it's just all the nations, the futility of mind, the the darkened understanding, the relationship-prohibiting ignorance, that all flows out of something else. There's something deeper. The world has a mind problem, Paul says, due to their hardness of heart. The problem of the mind flows out of the problem of the heart. The reason, Paul argues, why the world is ignorant of God is because the world has hardened their hearts to God. People have rejected God at a heart level. They've rejected his authority, his rightful rule and reign over us. The world has basically said to God, you are not the boss of me. I will do what I want and I will not submit to you. And it is as a result of this heart rejection of God as God that the world's thinking about God then begins to fall in line with the condition of their hearts. Paul says their minds are darkened as a a result due to the hardness of their heart. They harden their hearts to God and then they can easily rationalize their rejection of God on intellectual grounds. They can justify it based on their thinking. Now you see, Paul says this is a deeper problem than just not having enough information. And that's not all, right? Paul says that the result then of this hardness of heart with its subsequent intellectual darkness and descent into spiritual ignorance, there's another result that comes out of that, which he says, the world becomes callous as a result of that. That is, they become even harder 
to the things of God. And their callousness, their spiritual callousness, Paul says, then causes them to give themselves up to all kinds of sensuality. They are greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So Paul says, do you you see the process here? There's a hardness of heart, a rejection of God at the level of the will, which then produces a darkened mind, which engages in futile, empty, worthless thinking, and is further alienated from God because of ignorance of him, and that then produces even greater hardness, callousness of heart and mind, which frees people up to sin in every kind of fashion, and to do so in a way that people feel little or no guilt, No shame, no remorse, no regret. Their hearts and minds are callous to the things of God. Now, if you're familiar with the New Testament, you might say, hmm, this sounds familiar to something else Paul says. And if you're feeling that way, it's because this is very, very similar to what Paul says in Romans 1. If you flip over there, you see that beginning in Romans 1.21, Paul outlays, lays out a very similar process. He says that people knew God, that is, they knew of his existence and his power through creation, but they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. That is, they hardened their hearts to him. They rejected him. And as a result, Paul says, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became Fools, And so God then gives them up to the lusts of their hearts in all manner of impurity so that they then not only engage in wicked deeds, but they even, Paul adds in Romans 1, they give approval and celebrate those who practice such things. Paul says this is the, this is the inner workings of the pagan world of his day. Paul is giving the church in Ephesians the unvarnished truth about the real world. And of course, Paul is not just describing a phenomenon that's true in his world. He's really saying this is the way the world, the nations, this is the way every culture works at some level. People reject God at the level of the heart, at the level of the will. Their minds become darkened in their thinking, and they become increasingly callous so that they then give themselves to all kinds of impurity, and they do it with impunity. Can you not see this at work in our world today? When you see a state legislature in this country giving itself a a standing ovation because they have passed a law allowing abortion at any point in the pregnancy for any reason, and they're proud, I think that's a picture of what Paul is talking about. When you see courts trying to take a child away from parents because they will not allow their eight-year-old to undergo gender transformation surgery, I think that's a picture of what Paul's talking about. When you see a man plunge a car into a crowd of people fueled by racial and political hatred and then he gets thousands of people supporting him on social media, I think that's a picture of what Paul is talking about here. When you see the rampant sexual abuse in the church, people in power protecting others in power at the expense of young children, I think that's a picture of what Paul is talking about. It was true in the Greco-Roman world. It's true in our day. It was true long before that. The prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Now, Paul does not want to play theological parlor games. He wants us to know what the real world is like. I think Paul would say to us, don't ever underestimate the depravity of human nature. Don't underestimate what hardness of heart towards God with its subsequent darkened understanding and its subsequent spiritual callousness, giving itself over to every kind of impurity. Don't underestimate what that can produce. The Holocaust, 
slavery in this country, sexual impurity of every kind. And this, this past week, I actually read a, a serious argument for the endorsement of pedophilia, claiming it was just another innate sexual orientation that should be protected as part of people's basic human rights. This is the real world that we live in. This is the way the Gentiles walk then and now. Well, that may cause you to say right now, okay, I know what to do. I know what to do. Let's get as far away from the real world as possible. Let's go underground, right? Let's get off the grid. Let's get rid of all of our technology, all access to media. Don't let your kids interact with anyone. Maybe we could find just the right group of people and we could all move to a compound. I don't know, say like Alaska. Would that be far enough away? Yukon, some desert, right? The real world won't find us there. Paul would say to us, though, ah, be careful because the problem of the real world is even worse than you know. It's a problem that cannot be escaped with geographic or social isolation because the real world, with all of its corruptions, isn't just out there among the, the really bad folks, wherever you think they might be, I don't know, Hollywood or Wall Street or UC Berkeley. <laughs> Paul says, no, 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 the problem is actually in here. It's in our own hearts. Because Paul says here in these verses, you see, we all have an old self. An old self, he says, that belongs to this manner of life. It's corrupt with deceitful desires. We all have a nature that is ours by nature, and that nature is by nature hard towards God. And by nature, our minds are dark. We're ignorant of God. And by nature, we are callous towards evil and willing to commit all kinds of acts of impurity. And that old nature, it's, it's in us. It's present. It's lurking. It's deceiving us. It, it comes out in the very impurities which we have mentioned. Now, if you try to run away from the real world, if you try to hide and sequester yourself from the real world, hoping it will not find you, I have terrible news for you. Wherever you go, you bring the real world with you. Because it's in you. We have seen the enemy. And it is us. And if you don't think you are capable of some of the great social evils that trouble you, I don't think you know the real world in here very well. Just the right social pressure, you throw in a little fear, you, you add a compelling enemy that you can strike out against, and I think most of us could be convinced to do just about anything. And then we would have no problem convincing ourselves that we were absolutely right. So what do we do? If this is what we're up against, both out there and in here, where is our hope well, Paul believes we have very real hope, and he uses one little phrase here in this passage that, that is really the ground, the sufficient ground to battle against all the tyrannies of heart and mind in the real world. And that phrase is this, it is to learn Christ. To learn Christ. He says, Ephesians, in this crazy world, this is your hope, that you have learned Christ. What does it mean to learn Christ? Well, for starters, Paul says, you, it means you've got to hear about Jesus. You need to be taught in him, for the truth is in him. So Paul says, if you, if you want to be able to stand and, and actually live in this real world and live, then, then you need to learn Jesus. And of course, this is not just some touchy-feely form of learning and being. No, it begins with learning concrete theological truth about Jesus. To learn Christ is, is first and foremost to learn who he is, that he is God. 
He is the Word who was with God from the beginning and who is God. He is the second person of the Trinity who became man and took on flesh. And he now lives and exists as fully God and fully man forever. To learn Christ is not only to learn who he is, but it is to learn what he has done. How he became incarnate and then lived a perfect life in which he fulfilled the law of God on our behalf. How he then died on the cross for all of our sins and how in his death he not only paid the penalty for our sins that we deserve, but he actually broke the power that sin necessarily had over us for he put our old sinful selves, that old nature with all of its hardness of heart and darkened understanding and spiritual callousness and impure deeds, he put that nature to death so that it no longer necessarily rules over us. It does not necessarily control us anymore. For you see, Jesus has lived for us and died for us. And Jesus has then been raised from the dead for our salvation. He has triumphed over sin and death and the devil. He has now delivered us from the penalty and the necessary power of sin. And this Jesus, he now rules and reigns over us. He promises to lead us into all truth through his word and spirit. And he's coming again to make all things new. This Jesus He now gives us his life. He imparts it to us so that he lives in us. He gives us his strength and his power and his wisdom to walk in his ways. And Paul is saying, this is what, Ephesians, you have learned. And he's saying to the church in all time and places, this is what you must learn. You must learn the truth about Jesus. You must learn the truth about Christ and embrace this truth. But I think there's more here than just saying you have to learn all the truth about Jesus. Paul is not saying, hey, you got to learn this stuff so that you can win Bible Jeopardy. Paul has no interest in us saying, you know, I'll take substitutionary attunement for 400, Alex. No, he, he said, I want you to learn this and know this. Not so that you can just know stuff about Jesus, but so that through that doctrine, through that teaching, you can actually come to know Jesus. For he is not just a body of information. He is a living, active, real, personal God and Savior. So Paul wants us to hear about him and learn about him as the truth is in him so that we can say, I know him. I have learned Christ. I have come to know him as my savior, my God, my king. And Paul goes on to say, when we we learn Christ in this way, we are enabled to do two things. One is we're able to put off that old self. Jesus has defeated it. It no longer necessarily rules us, but it's still present. It's still lingering, still tempting, still calling to us, but... As we learn Christ and we come to know him and we are known by him, Paul says we're able to put off that old self. We're able to say, I I will not be hard to God. I will submit to him as my God and my king. I will not seek to be wise in my own eyes. I will submit myself to the authority of God's word. I will not give myself over to acts of impurity and then try to justify it after the fact. No, Paul says that through learning Christ, who he is, what he's done, and coming to know him in a personal way, that enables us to say, no, I'm going to put off that old life. It's who I was, but it's not who I am anymore. And, And of course, Paul then says that we're not just enabled to say no to what we were. We're able to say yes to who we now are in Christ. We are renewed, Paul says, by the Spirit of God so that we're able to put on the new self, which, Paul says, is created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. But this putting on of the new self is quite literally simply putting on Christ. For as we read in our prep for worship verse in Romans 13, Paul says, put on on Christ. We don't have to say, do I put on Christ or do I put on the new self? No, they're one and the same. Paul says, put on Christ and make no provision 
for the flesh. You see, Jesus has not only done a set of things for us, but he has given us himself. He didn't just live for us and die for us and was raised for us. He's not only coming again for us, but right now, Jesus gives himself, his living, active self, to the one who believes in him. He gives us his heart. He gives us his mind, his spiritual sensitivity to the things of the Father. He actually gives us his holiness so that as we come to learn Jesus, as we come to know him through his word and spirit, we put off that old life and we put on Christ. That, that, that he now increasingly uh, lives in us, holds sway over us more and more than he's conforming us to his likeness in the way we think and in what we value and in his way of life. This is the life of the new self, and it is only possible through learning Christ. When Paul says, put on the new self, he's not just saying, it's not just fancy theological word for go out and try to be better. He's saying, no, you got to know Jesus and let Jesus change you from the inside out so that his character becomes your character. Paul is not ignorant, and he is certainly not naive about the evils of the world or the evils that exist in our own hearts. He knows where such evils arise. He knows how they grow and how they manifest themselves. And he knows how to combat them. And you combat them with Christian truth about Jesus. We must learn Jesus. We must learn about him in order that we might truly know him. We must learn doctrine concerning him so that we might enter into fellowship with him. We need theology, sound doctrine about Christ, but not for theology's own sake. Not so we can just sit around and discuss things about Jesus, but we need theology about Jesus so that we can know Jesus in truth, who he is, what he's done. We can know him in a personal way because it's this living, active Jesus who's the only one who can change our sinful hearts, make us into new creations. It's only Jesus who can enable us to stand in the present evil day. It's only Jesus who can give us hearts that submit to God, minds that truly know God, soft and tender hearts that love God and lives that seek to obey him. So when we gather as a church community and we preach Christ and him crucified, when we declare week after week, he is risen, he is risen indeed, we are not playing theological games to distract ourselves from the real world. We are encountering the one true living Jesus who we are seeking to learn about him so that we may know him, so that his life may grow in us and produce a people who can actually live for God in such a world. As the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, so it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me, and the life that I now live by faith, I, but the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So brothers and sisters, may we with sober minds and submissive hearts seek to learn Christ. To learn about him, yes, but to learn about him that we may learn him and know him so that through his word and through his spirit we might be transformed by the living and active Jesus as he changes our heart and our mind, and our actions, as he gives us wisdom and discernment to know what's going on in the world, and strength and courage to stand for him and walk with him all in all we do and say, until the day when we are physically with him, and we see him face to face, and the trials of this world are no more. Until that day, may we press on to learn Christ, to put him on, that we may live for him in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you.
and we, Lord, would we would recognize we are we are up against it. We live in a, a crooked and perverse generation, a people of unclean lips, and we ourselves, as Isaiah said, are people of unclean lips. We don't just need to be saved from the world, we need to be saved from ourselves. And we praise you, Father, that you have sent just such a Savior. We praise you that Jesus saves us from the world and the flesh and the devil and that there is life to be found in him. Give us the grace to learn Christ, to put him on, sound mind, tender hearts, holy lives as we follow after our blessed Savior. And he leads us all the way. We pray these things in Jesus' name.